Deleuze without Negri. Negri's Eurocentrism is discernible already in the opposition between expression and representation on which his entire thought is based. The logic of political representation, the state or political parties as representing people, versus the logic of expression, social movements expressing the free creativity of the multitude. Representation deals with individuals who are represented in the universal sphere, marked by the gap between their empirical particularity and their transcendental or legal universality. Singularities are atoms which are directly interactive and productive, expressing their creative power. Philosophically, this means Descartes, Kant versus Spinoza. There are clearly discernible echoes here of Sartre's notion of the practico-inert, developed in his critique of dialectical reason. The theoretical problem here is, can one imagine a society fully organized in terms of expression of the multitude, a society of absolute democracy, a society without representation, a society of permanent mobilization, a society in which every objective structure is a direct expression of subjective productivity? What we encounter here is the old philosophical logic of becoming versus being, living productivity versus the sterility of an inert structure of representation, where every representation is parasitical upon productive expressivity. Perhaps one should shift the accent here from no representation without expressive productivity to no expressive productivity without representation. It is structurally impossible to totalize the multitude of movements. Absolute democracy, the full and direct reign of multitude, is a perspectival illusion, a composite image of the false overlapping of two heterogeneous dimensions. Tarkovsky's Solaris ends with the director's archetypal fantasy of combining within the same shot the otherness into which the hero is thrown, the chaotic surface of Solaris, and the object of his nostalgic longing, the home dacha to which he longs to return, the house whose contours are encircled by the malleable slime of Solaris's surface. Within radical otherness, we discover the lost object of our innermost longing. The same phantasmatic staging concludes Tarkovsky's nostalgia. In the midst of the Italian countryside, encircled by the fragments of a cathedral in ruins, that is, of the place in which the hero was adrift, cut off from his roots, there stands an element totally out of place, the Russian dacha, the stuff of the hero's dreams. Here, too, the shot begins with a close-up of only the recumbent hero in front of his dacha, so that for a moment it may seem that he has in fact returned home. The camera then slowly pulls back to divulge the properly phantasmatic setting of the dacha against the backdrop of the Italian countryside. This concluding fantasy is an artificial condensation of opposed, incompatible perspectives, somehow like the standard optician's test in which we see through one eye a cage, through the other eye a parrot, and if our two eyes are well coordinated in their axes, when we open both eyes we should see the parrot in the cage. And what if it is the same with Negri's absolute democracy, for the multitude directly ruling itself? What if the gap between the multitude and power is here to stay? This does not mean that we should abandon Deleuze. What we should abandon is merely Negri's one-sided appropriation of Deleuze, an appropriation which leaves out the radical duality of Deleuze's thought. There are two incompatible ontologies at work in Deleuze. The Deleuze who celebrates the productive power of the virtual flow is forever haunted by the Deleuze who conceives the virtual flow of sense as a sterile immaterial effect positing an irreducible gap between material productivity and the virtual flow of sense. The elementary coordinates of Deleuze's ontology are provided by the opposition between the virtual and the actual. The space of the actual, real acts in the present, experienced reality, and subjects as persons qua formed individuals, accompanied by its virtual shadow, the field of proto-reality, of multiple singularities, impersonal elements later synthesized into our experience of reality. This is the Deleuze of transcendental empiricism, the Deleuze who gives to Kant's transcendental his unique twist. The proper transcendental space is the virtual space of multiple singular potentialities, 
of pure impersonal singular gestures, affects and perceptions that are not yet the gestures, affects, perceptions of a pre-existing, stable and self-identical subject. This is why, for example, Deleuze celebrates the art of cinema. It liberates the gaze, images, movements and ultimately time itself from their attribution to a given subject. When we watch a movie, we see the flow of images from the perspective of the mechanical camera, a perspective which does not belong to any subject. Through the art of montage, movement is also abstracted, liberated from its attribution to a given subject or object. It is an impersonal movement which is only secondarily, a posteriori, attributed to some positive entities. Here, however, the first crack in this edifice appears. In a move which is far from self-evident, Deleuze links this conceptual space to the traditional opposition between production and representation. The virtual field is reinterpreted as that of generative productive forces, opposed to the space of representations. Here we face all the standard topics of the molecular multiple sites of productivity constrained by the molar totalizing organizations, and so on and so forth. Under the heading of the opposition between becoming and being, Deleuze thus seems to identify these two logics, although they are fundamentally incompatible. One is tempted to attribute the bad influence which pushed him towards the second logic to Felix Guattari. The proper site of production is not the virtual space as such, but rather the very passage from it to constituted reality. The collapse of the multitude and its oscillations into one reality. Production is fundamentally a limitation of the open space of virtualities, the determination negation of the virtual multitude. This is how Deleuze reads Spinoza's Omni Determinatio Es Negatio against Hegel. The line of Deleuze proper is that of the great early monographs, the key ones being difference in repetition and the logic of sense, as well as some of the short introductory writings, like Proust and Signs and the introduction to Saka Masok. In his late work, it is the two cinema books which mark the return to the topics of the logic of sense. This series is to be distinguished from the books Deleuze and Guattari co-wrote, and one can only regret that the Anglo-Saxon reception of Deleuze, and also the political impact of Deleuze, is predominantly that of a waterized Deleuze. It is crucial to note that not a single one of Deleuze's own texts is in any way directly political. Deleuze in himself was a highly elitist author, indifferent to politics. The only serious philosophical question is thus, what inherent impasse caused Deleuze to turn towards Guattari? Is Anti-Oedipus, arguably Deleuze's worst book, not the result of escaping the full confrontation of a deadlock by a simplified flat solution? Homologous to Schelling, escaping the deadlock of his Weltalter project by his shift to the duality of positive and negative philosophy, or Habermas escaping the deadlock of the dialectic of enlightenment by his shift to the duality of instrumental and communicative reason. Our task is to confront again this deadlock. Was, therefore, Deleuze not pushed towards Guattari because Guattari presented an alibi, an easy escape from the deadlock of his previous position? Does Deleuze's conceptual structure not rely on two logics, on two conceptual oppositions, which coexist in his work? This insight seems so obvious, stating it so close to what the French call a la palisade, that one is surprised it has not yet been generally perceived. First, on the one hand, the logic of sense, of immaterial becoming as the sense event, as the effect of bodily material processes causes. The logic of the radical gap between the generative process and its immaterial sense effect. Multiplicities, being incorporeal effects of material causes, are impossible or causally sterile entities. The time of a pure becoming, always already past and eternally yet to come, forms the temporal dimension of this impassibility or sterility of multiplicities. And is cinema not the ultimate case of the sterile flow of surface becoming? The cinematic image is inherently sterile and impassive, the pure effect of corporeal causes, although nonetheless acquiring its pseudo-autonomy. Second, on the other hand, the logic of becoming as the production of beings. The emergence of metric or extensive properties should be treated as a single process in which a continuous virtual space-time progressively differentiates itself into actual discontinuous spatio-temporal structures. 
In Say, his analyses of film and literature, Deleuze emphasizes the desubstantialization of affects. In a work of art, an affect, boredom, for example, is no longer attributable to actual persons, but becomes a free-floating event. How then does this impersonal intensity of an affect event relate to bodies or persons? Here we encounter the same ambiguity. Either this immaterial affect is generated by interacting bodies as a sterile surface of pure becoming, or it is part of the virtual intensities out of which bodies emerge through actualization, the passage from becoming to being. And is this opposition not yet again that of materialism versus idealism? In Deleuze, this means the logic of sense versus anti-Oedipus. Either the sense event, the flow of pure becoming, is the immaterial effect, neutral, neither active nor passive, of the intrication of bodily material causes, or the positive bodily entities are themselves the product of the pure flow of becoming. Either the infinite field of virtuality is an immaterial effect of interacting bodies, or the bodies themselves emerge, actualize themselves, from this field of virtuality. In the logic of sense, Deleuze himself develops this opposition in the guise of two possible modes of the genesis of reality. The formal genesis, the emergence of reality out of the immanence of impersonal consciousness as the pure flow of becoming, is supplemented by the real genesis, the latter accounting for the emergence of the immaterial event surface itself out of bodily interaction. Is this opposition of the virtual as the site of productive becoming and the virtual as the site of the sterile sense event, not, at the same time, the opposition of the body without organs, BWO, and organs without a body, OWAB. Is, on the one hand, the productive flux of pure becoming, not the BWO, the body not yet structured or determined as functional organs? And, on the other hand, are the OWAB, not the virtuality of the pure affect extracted from its embeddedness in a body, like the smile in Alice in Wonderland that persists alone, even when the Cheshire Cat's body is no longer present. All right, said the cat, and this time it vanished quite slowly, beginning with the end of the tale and ending with the grin, which remained some time after the rest of it had gone. Well, I've often seen a cat without a grin, thought Alice, but a grin without a cat, it's the most curious thing I ever saw in my life. This notion of extracted OWAB reemerges forcefully in the time image, in the guise of the gaze itself, as such an autonomous organ no longer attached to a body. These two logics, event as the power which generates reality, event as the sterile, pure effect of bodily interactions, also involve two privileged psychological stances. The generative event of becoming relies on the productive force of the schizo, this explosion of the unified subject in the impersonal multitude of desiring intensities, intensities that are subsequently constrained by the Oedipal matrix. The event as sterile, immaterial effect, relies on the figure of the masochist who finds satisfaction in the tedious repetitive game of staged rituals whose function is to postpone forever the sexual passage à l'acte, can one effectively imagine a stronger contrast than that of the schizo throwing himself without any reservation into the flux of multiple passions, and of the masochist clinging to the theatre of shadows in which his meticulously staged performances repeat again and again the same sterile gesture? So what if we conceive Deleuze's opposition of the intermixing of material bodies and the immaterial effect of sense along the lines of the Marxist opposition of base and superstructure? Is not the flow of becoming the superstructure par excellence, the sterile theatre of shadows ontologically cut off from the site of material production, and precisely as such the only possible space of the event? The tension between Deleuze's two ontologies clearly translates into two different political logics and practices. The ontology of productive becoming clearly leads to the leftist topic of the self-organization of the multitude of molecular groups, which resist and undermine the molar totalizing systems of power. The old notion of the spontaneous, non-hierarchical, living multitude opposing the oppressive, reified system, the exemplary case of leftist radicalism linked to philosophical idealist subjectivism. 
The problem is that this is the only model of the politicization of Deleuze's thought available. The other ontology, that of the sterility of the sense event, appears apolitical. However, what if this other ontology also involves a political logic and practice of its own, of which Deleuze himself was unaware? Should we not then proceed like Lenin in 1915, when, in order to ground a new revolutionary practice, he returned to Hegel, not to his directly political writings, but primarily to his logic? What if, in the same way, there is another Deleuzean politics to be discovered here? The first hint in this direction may be provided by the already mentioned parallel between the couple, corporeal causes, immaterial flow of becoming, and the old Marxist couple, base superstructure. Such a politics would take into account both the irreducible duality of objective, material, socio-economic processes taking place in reality, as well as the explosion of revolutionary events, of the political logic proper. What if the domain of politics is inherently sterile, the domain of pseudo-causes, a shadow theatre, but nonetheless crucial in transforming reality? What this means is that one should accept the gap between sterile virtual movements and the actuality of power. This solution is more paradoxical than it may appear. One should bear in mind that virtuality stands for expressive productivity, while actual state power operates at the level of representation. Productivity is real, the state is representative. This is the way to break out of the philosophical paradigm of productivity versus the positive order of being. The true gap is not that between reality and its representation. Reality and representation are not opposed, but on the same side. They form the same order of positive being. Productivity is thus not the metaphysical principle or source of reality, to be opposed to the mere appearance of substantial being. Substantial being is all there really is, while the causality of productivity is a pseudo-causality, since productivity operates in a sterile, shadowy, virtual domain. Is this duality not prefigured in the Heideggerian struggle between world and earth, which we encounter today in the antinomy that defines our experience? On the one hand, there is the fluidification, volatilization of our experience. It's desubstantialization. This exponentially exploding lightness of being culminates in the cyber dream of the transformation of our very identity as a human being from hardware to software, to a program able to be reloaded from one to another hardware. Reality is here virtualized. Any failure can be undone by rewinding and having another try at it. However, this virtualized world in which we dwell is threatened by the shadow of what we usually designate as the prospect of ecological catastrophe, the imponderable heaviness and complexity, the inertia of Earth catching up, reminding us of the fragile equilibrium which forms the invisible background foundation of our survival on Earth, and which we can destroy, and thus destroy ourselves, through global warming, through new viruses, through a gigantic asteroid hitting the Earth. Never in the history of humanity was the tension so palpable between the unbearable lightness of our being the media providing us with the stranger sensations with the click, cutting through the resistance of reality, promising a frictionless world, and the unpredictable background of the earth. At the political level proper, is not Negri himself on the tracks of the solution of asserting the irreducible gap when he proposes the formula of governance as the tension dialogue between state power and the self-organized multitudes movements? Ma was well aware of this duality, which is why he intervened at the climax of the Cultural Revolution, when the Shanghai Commune attempted to get rid of the party-state apparatus itself and replace it with communal self-organization. Such an organization, he warned, is too weak when it comes to suppressing counter-revolution. When it comes to this threat, one needs pure and raw power. Of all important things, the possession of power is the most important. Such being the case, the revolutionary masses, with a deep hatred for the class enemy, make up their minds to unite, form a great alliance, and seize power. Seize power! Seize power! All the party power, political power, and financial power usurped by the counter-revolutionary revisionists and those diehards who persistently cling to the bourgeois reactionary line, must be recaptured.
This intervention by Mao is usually quoted as the proof of his ruthless manipulation of the Red Guards. He only needed them to crush his opponents within the party nomenclatura, so that the moment this job was done and the Guardists persisted, wanting to dissolve the party state apparatus and effectively take it over, he instructed the army, the only stable state apparatus still functioning, to intervene, crushing the Red Guards' resistance and sending millions of the Guardists to the countryside to re-educate them. What if, however, such a reading is all too simple and misses the point? What if Mao was aware that the very flourishing of movements of the multitude always already had to rely on some dispositif of power which structures and sustains the very space within which they operate? Today, the movements for gay rights, human rights, and so on all rely on state apparatuses, which are not only the addressee of their demands, but also provide the framework for their activity, stable civil life. The more fundamental reproach to Mao is the standard one of the postmodern left to traditional Leninist Marxists, that they all focus on state power, on taking over state power. However, the various successes in taking state power miserably failed in their goals, so the left should adopt a different, apparently more modest, but in fact much more radical strategy, to withdraw from state power and focus on directly transforming the very texture of social life, everyday practices which sustain the entire social structure. This position was given its most elaborated form by John Holloway, change the world without taking power. The continually contested separation of doing, human activity, living labor, and the done, dead labor, capital, means that relations between people are reduced to relations between things. The social flow of doing, what Holloway terms human power to, is broken by power over. Our everyday existence is a series of struggles, hidden and open, violent and suppressed, conscious and unconscious. We are not a sleeping beauty, a humanity frozen in our alienation until our prince party comes to kiss us, we live rather in constant struggle to free ourselves from the curse. Any radical social change must therefore be anti-fetishistic in its approach, but the very opposite of fetishism is precisely the dark void which cannot be seen or plotted, the path we make by treading, the questions we ask in asking itself. There is a moment of truth in this approach. This truth is the truth first given its classic formulation by La Boétie in his Treatise on Voluntary Servitude. Our passive endurement of power constitutes it. We do not obey and fear power because it is in itself so powerful. On the contrary, power appears powerful because we treat it as such. This fact opens up the space for a magical passive revolution which, instead of directly confronting power, gradually undermines it through the subterranean digging of the mole through abstaining from participation in the everyday rituals and practices that sustain it. In a way, was Mahatma Gandhi not doing exactly this when he led the anti-British resistance in India? Instead of directly attacking the colonial state, he organized movements of civil disobedience, of boycotting British products, of creating a social space outside the scope of the colonial state. Another field of such undermining of the rule of capital is consumer self-organization. On this view, one should drop the traditional leftist privileging of production as the only substantial reality of social life. The position of the worker-producer and that of consumer should be sustained as irreducible in their divergence, without privileging one as the deeper truth of the other. Value is created in the production process, However, it is, as it were, created there only potentially, since it is only actualized as value when the produced commodity is sold and the circle MCM is thus completed. Crucial in this temporal gap between the production of value and its actualization, even if value is produced in production, without the successful completion of the process of circulation, there is, stricto sensu, no value. The temporality is here that of the futur and tirieur. In other words, value is not immediately, it only will have been. It is retroactively actualized, performatively enacted. In production, value is generated in itself, while only through the completed circulation process does it become for itself. This is how Kojin Karatani resolves the Kantian antinomy of value, which is and is not generated in the process of production. 
it is generated there only in itself. And it is because of this gap between in and for itself that capitalism needs formal democracy and equality. What precisely distinguishes capital from the master-slave relation is that the worker confronts him as consumer and possessor of exchange values, and that in the form of the possessor of money, in the form of money, he becomes a simple center of circulation, one of its infinitely many centers in which his specificity as worker is extinguished. What this means is that in order to complete the circle of its reproduction, capital has to pass through this critical point at which the roles are inverted. Surplus value is realized in principle only by workers in totality buying back what they produce. This point is crucial for Karatani. It provides the key leverage from which to oppose the rule of capital today. Is it not natural that the proletarian should focus their attack on that unique point at which they approach capital from the position of a buyer, and consequently at which it is capital which is forced to court them? If workers can become subjects at all, it is only as consumers. Today, this key role of consumption has reasserted itself in an unexpected way, referring to Georges Bataille's notion of the general economy of sovereign expenditure, which he opposes to the restrained economy of capitalism's endless profiteering. The German post-humanist philosopher Peter Sloterdijk provides the outlines of capitalism split from itself, its imminent self-overcoming. Capitalism culminates when it creates out of itself its own most radical and the only fruitful opposite, totally different from what the classical left, caught in its miserabilism, was able to dream about. His positive mention of Andrew Carnegie shows the way. The sovereign self-negating gesture of the endless accumulation of wealth is to spend this wealth on things beyond price and outside market circulation the public good, the arts and sciences, health, and so on. This concluding sovereign gesture enables the capitalist to break out of the vicious cycle of endless expanded reproduction, of gaining money in order to earn more money. When he donates his accumulated wealth to the public good, the capitalist self-negates himself as the mere personification of capital and its reproductive circulation. His life acquires meaning. It is no longer just expanded reproduction as an autotelic goal. Furthermore, the capitalist thus accomplishes the shift from eros to thymos, from the perceived erotic logic of accumulation to public recognition and reputation. What this amounts to is nothing less than elevating figures such as Soros or Gates to personifications of the inherent self-negation of the capitalist process itself. Their work of charity their immense donations to public welfare, is not just a personal idiosyncrasy. Whether sincere or hypocritical, it is the logical concluding point of capitalist circulation, necessary from the strictly economic standpoint, since it allows the capitalist system to postpone its crisis. It re-establishes balance, a kind of redistribution of wealth to the truly needy, without falling into a fatal trap. The destructive logic of resentment and enforced status redistribution of wealth which can only end in generalized misery. It also avoids, one might add, the other mode of re-establishing a kind of balance and asserting thymos through sovereign expenditure, namely wars. This paradox signals a sad predicament of ours. Contemporary capitalism cannot reproduce itself on its own. It needs extra economic charity to sustain the cycle of social reproduction.